Hello and welcome to this edition of Straight Talk. I'm Emily Chan, standing in for Bernie Lowe. In this week's show, we take a closer look at two key Asian financial centers, namely Hong Kong and Singapore. These two cities regularly top rankings for doing business, even outdoing their Western peers, going head to head in the likes of banking, IPOs, and attracting top talent. We begin with a look at new listings. Ag Bank, AIA, Glencore, Prada. Hong Kong has had no lack of big names to grace its force. And though the recent financial crisis has sapped some of the zing from the IPO market, Hong Kong was still the choice location for a third year running in 2011, attracting some $30 billion in funds. Most companies choosing to list there to tap the potential from nearby China. We have been seeing a very fast acceleration uh, of, of uh, financial integration between China and Hong Kong uh, as long as uh, there are financial services that can pro be provided to foreign investors that can help them enter China or invest in China, then it's always a, a good theme. Singapore, meanwhile, has positioned itself as the Asian gateway. Nearly half of the companies on the Singapore exchange are from outside its shores. Though the city still trails Hong Kong, it hasn't done too shabby either. Hong Kong's Hutchison Ports, part of the Lee Kaohsiung Empire, chose to list its trust unit in Singapore in a $5.5 billion listing last year, the biggest for the city-state and in Southeast Asia. Singapore is by far the most dominant exchange in Asia outside of Japan in uh, terms of market cap, in terms of liquidity, in terms of number of comps for real estate investment trusts. So you do have not just Singapore-based uh, real estate investment trusts listed here, but you have real estate investment trusts that have assets all over the world or all over Asia that are listed in Singapore. We could see another one of Lee's holdings on the Singapore Bourse. Plans are in the works for a near $800 million listing of a UN-denominated REIT from ARA Asset Management, the first for the Lion City. This is likely to pick up as China slowly looks for more places to park its currency. Hong Kong had its first yuan-denominated REIT IPO last year, Huixian REIT, also owned by Li ka -shing. But Singapore is not stopping there. It's gone all out to lure big international names. Talk was it had reduced the IPO waiting time to approve Manchester United's $1 billion IPO, which is likely to hit the market by year-end. And it's also gotten high recommendation from Formula One's Bernie Eccleston, should F1's private equity owners choose to float part of its business. We're going to talk more now about Asian IPOs, and we're joined by Keith Pogson. He's a managing partner at Ernst & Young to delve more into the subject. Thanks for joining us today. Now, Ernst & Young just issued a report, and uh, we saw that in the first quarter of this year, there was a decline in a company raising funds. Which country continues to be the most popular? Well, the leader still is Hong Kong and China. So Greater China still contributed 47% of the world IPOs in the first quarter. It's actually a substantial proportion, and that follows through for many of the previous previous quarters as well. Eight out of 20 IPOs took place in Asia. Are you seeing a shift to the east? I think it's just a repeat of an ongoing theme. You know, the, the first quarter really didn't have many large IPOs, but in terms of volume, we still see lots and lots of them coming to the market in Asia. It just happened that there were 12 of them that were outside Asia in the first quarter. Now, Hong Kong, for three years running, topped the leaderboards in terms of IPO funds raised around the world. Do you uh, expect this trend to continue? I think so. I think the depth and liquidity of the Hong Kong market is now becoming dominant globally. So people really see this. If you want to do something with depth and size, you really need to come to Hong Kong. Now, when the Shanghai market finally opens up for international listings, is there a concern that the Hong Kong market will become irrelevant? I don't think so. I think for, for international money, Hong Kong is still the gateway to Asia. It's still the market with the depth and liquidity that really attracts international investors to Asia. It's the connection point. It has high quality standards, great legal framework and so on. And that still is a real attracting uh, situation for uh, investors. Now, will Hong Kong have a need to reinvent itself when this actually happens? Well, I think Hong Kong already has reinvented itself. What I mean by that is it's becoming increasingly the global forum for uh, resource companies. So we've seen um, already some of the Canadian companies come here. We've seen Russian companies. We've seen other Asian companies already come to Hong Kong as a mining center, which is very different from where it was before. It's really the China goes out market. It's now becoming a global center in its own right. Now, we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies uh, come to list in Hong Kong. Uh, what is Singapore doing? What does it need to do in order to catch up? 
Well, I think it's, a, it's actually a very difficult situation for Singapore relatively. It doesn't have the tradition of taking these large Chinese corporations to market. And it similarly hasn't actually eked out its own space, you know, whether it being mining or insurance or one of these other big sectors that Hong Kong's really dominant in. So I think actually the, the market's very different. The, uh, Singapore is an opportunity to become a hub for Southeast Asia, but I think it's unlikely to take away Hong Kong's dominance as the Asian capital market center. Now, stock exchanges have struggled to innovate and have rushed to merge because uh, to better help with their competition. Both the Singapore and Hong Kong markets have remained single. Do you see in the near term either market attaching on to another bourse? Well, I think the, increasingly the real competitor for the stock markets is actually the dark pools, as they're called. It's alternative exchanges. And I think we'll see more and more of those. You know, recent announcements in China have discussed having OTC markets in China even. So I think it's going to be those dark pools, those alternative markets that are going to be the real threat for the existing exchanges, not other geographic exchanges. Do you see eventually the Hong Kong Stock Exchange merging with Shanghai or Shenzhen? That is a possible outcome. Um, however, there's still substantial regulatory barriers at this point in time. It's possible, but I think it's not going to happen in the near future. Do you see Hong Kong's reliance on the Chinese markets as an asset or a liability? Well, as I say, increasingly, Hong Kong is not reliant on the Chinese market. It's having IPOs from other jurisdictions. Looking forward, I think we'll start to see many more come from new emerging markets like Mongolia with its large mining resources. Canada, we've seen some of the, uh, the shale companies starting to come here as well. Russia, we've seen commodity companies from Russia. It's now increasingly about what you sell to China rather than what comes from China. Now, some are saying that the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is two years behind in terms of technology, trading platforms, uh, compared to that of the Singapore Stock Exchange. Uh, recently, the stock market here has announced a three billion Hong Kong dollar project to put to basically advance us and push us forward. Is this too little too late? Um, I think it's not too little till late. This is still a formative market and globally people are str still struggling with high frequency trading, co-location, these technology driven themes. So I think most of the investors who are coming to Hong Kong are still looking for long term investment. This is not about arbitrage, it's not about short termism. It's about real investment in underlying businesses. And what in your opinion do you think Hong Kong needs to do to stay ahead of Singapore? Well, I think Hong Kong needs to continue to uh, innovate in the space of what it allows to list you know whether we have business trusts whether we have overseas listings from jurisdictions that hong kong isn't listing at the moment for example vietnam and so on other neighborly environments how hong kong works with those markets what gets listed in hong kong and the regulation around that i think with innovations in that space we'll see hong kong making great advances in the in the market and uh, finally uh, recently of course uh, in, a, in an attempt to boost competition the uh stock market operator here reduced the lunch hour for all of the traders. Now it's just one hour long. Has this done anything? Um, well, I, th I think volumes haven't moved dramatically because of this, but I'm not sure whether that's the best indicator. It's probably too early to tell because old practices die hard. I'm not sure whether people are still going for long lunches or not. Thanks, Keith, for speaking with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a dead heat between Hong Kong and Singapore as these two key Asian financial cities battle to come out tops. So who's more competitive? Well, according to a recent study conducted by Citigroup and the Economist Intelligence Unit, Singapore placed third behind New York and London. And if you're curious about Hong Kong, it tied for fourth place with Paris. Now, to talk more about this, we're joined by Michael Zink. He's headed at ASEAN at Citigroup. Michael? Hi, Emily. Hi. How are you? Lovely to have you uh, here with us today. Nice to be with you. Now, based on your recent survey, are you surprised that Singapore placed third? Oh, I'm not at all surprised that Singapore was third. This study looked at 120 cities around the world. They capture 750 million people, about a third of the world's economic activity. And it's no surprise to us at City that Singapore came out the most competitive city in Asia and the third in the world. Now, what exactly was it that put it there? I mean, there's eight pillars of competitiveness in this index. Right. Well, Singapore has, has put together this fantastic mixture of attractions that has brought more and more business to Singapore over the last couple of decades. Great first world infrastructure, wonderful talent, and openness. Uh, people talk about business friendly. I don't know any cities that are business unfriendly, but Singapore is, is welcoming to, to visitors, to businessmen, to capital. It's a great place to do business. Now, how do you see Singapore's growth trajectory in terms of competitiveness over the next couple of years? If we look at Singapore's growth, I think Singapore is only getting started. 
Uh, Singapore's success is built around its people, its policies, its attitudes, and all of that continues to develop, to mature, to expand. And as more people around the world discover Singapore, discover the real Singapore today, I think its growth is uh, going to continue to rise. Okay, enough about Singapore for right now. Now, your survey covered more than 100 cities. What about the results surprised you the most this year? Well, we look at the cities. Uh, I, I think this survey confirms a couple of things. That one, urbanization is one of the great trends in the 21st century. For the first time ever in human history, more than 50% of the population on Earth live, lives in a city. And by the end of the 21st century, that might be 75%. So how cities operate and how we manage the, the urban environment is going to be key to the decades ahead. This survey looks at who's doing that well. It also confirmed a second trend that's key to our strategy, which is economic activity is rebalancing itself. It's finding a new center of gravity, and that equilibrium is coming east. And it's, it's more back to normal, if you will. Uh, Asia re, is regaining its place as the largest economic uh, region in the world. About 60% of economic activity will be in Asia before the century's out. Back to normal. Now you're saying that things are shifting to the east. Is New York and London going to be able to hold on to their top one and two spots? Uh, we get this question a lot. New York, London, Singapore, other financial centers. Let me put it in perspective with some very hard numbers. Foreign exchange. The world trades about $4 trillion a day. Singapore is the fourth biggest FX center in the world, but we only have 5% of the world's volumes. London's number one with about 35%. All right, now it's easy to see a world where London goes from 35 to 30 and Singapore goes from 5 to 10. That would dramatically change the activity here in Singapore, but London would still remain a very important financial center. New York and London will be financial centers, important financial centers uh, for the rest of our careers. Now, we haven't talked about Hong Kong at all. No? Uh, how does Hong Kong fare uh, compared to Singapore? Well, you look at Hong Kong, fourth in the world, New York, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, that's a pretty wonderful set of cities out of 120. So Hong Kong's done very well as well. Gateway to China, a well-developed, mature financial center, they're doing very, very well. Fourth place, that's pretty good. Now, according to your survey, competitiveness is defined as the ability to attract capital, business, talent, and visitors. How does a city go about improving that? Well, I think a place like Singapore has laid the welcome mat out. It's, it's easy to do business here if you follow the rules. And the rules are very clear. We also talk about how the world has changed in financial centers on the other side of the global financial crisis with a great deal of regulatory change underway. Singapore's been very clear about its rules, its regulations, and its laws, but it's easy to do business here. And I think that's how you attract capital. That's how you attract business. You make it, you make it transparent. Now, your study forecasts that Western economies will see somber growth outlooks in the coming decade. Right. How is Asia's economic rise going to be reflected in their competitiveness? Well, if you look what the survey says, yeah, economic growth in the West will be lower than economic growth in the Asia-Pacific region. But this study looks at very many things about talent, about capital, about uh, the attractiveness of these cities for places to live. So I think those cities in the other parts of the world will retain their advantages but singapore continues to build on its own so yes the west is in for slower growth in asia but i don't think that changes the fact that new york's still a very interesting place to live okay i'm going to ask you another question about hong kong it's seen very much as a gateway to china yes. now with the rise of shanghai and we're seeing you know success here in singapore will hong kong's role uh basically be not needed anymore is it more an asset or a liability that it's a gateway to china let me answer that very interesting question the best way I can. With more economic activity shifting towards the east, the need for more financial services in the east is, is, is evident. So the financial services centers in this part of the world will continue to grow. I'm not sure it's one or the other. Shanghai is going to grow and its importance in the financial services world will become more, will rise. But that doesn't mean that Hong Kong will become less important as, as the total volume of financial services activity rises in this part of the world, they may both continue to go up. Michael, thank you so much for your time thank today. Thank you, Emily. Nice to see you. And you. Come back again soon. I will certainly will.